Welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and as ever, we are in the studio with ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin. In today's conclusion of our special Threat Horizon 2021 series, we're looking at the final theme, when digital competitors rip up the rule book. Competing in the digital marketplace will become increasingly difficult as threats to businesses grow in speed and precision. Software and application weaknesses will continue to be leaked online with ever-decreasing time to fix them. The breakup of tech giants will plunge those reliant on their products and services into disarray, and organizations rushing to deliver ambitious digital transformations will expose their vulnerabilities instead of cementing their resilience. Steve, we know that businesses are under increasing pressure to deliver digital transformation. But what happens when these projects fail? Yeah, and we've seen uh, quite a few examples of that, haven't we? Fairly recently, I'm thinking of some of the criticism around Equifax, for instance. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of uh, some of the challenges that we've seen in the banking space with a UK bank where, you know, almost two million customers were unable to access their accounts, their money, for a, a significant number of days mm. because of a digital transformation program that simply went wrong. And the challenge, I think, for organizations in this particular space is that there is undoubtedly a drive to try to introduce new systems, to stay competitive, to keep abreast of what technology can offer. And consumers expect that. But all too often, what we're doing is we're building new infrastructure on top of legacy systems. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we very often don't know what those legacy systems look like. Perhaps the insight into how they've been operated or designed or built, maintained, is no longer with the enterprise. And so we're building effectively, in some instances, a house on very little foundation. Mm -hmm. And I think that that certainly is behind what we saw with the UK bank that had problems. Certainly it was one of the criticisms, as I mentioned, around Equifax, where they had been hugely acquisitive and uh, really hadn't conducted some of the due diligence around the systems that they were then integrating into that overall system. Um, you could say that uh, one of the other major breaches that we've seen you know, with Marriott and Starwood, how aware were Marriott of, of the Starwood systems? Again, legacy systems when they made that purchase. And, and these are not isolated examples. So for me anyway, this whole area of digital transformation is one that really needs to be addressed, I think, very much more tightly, very much more closely by organizations. But there's going to be a trade-off because we are talking about some fairly sophisticated legacy systems. Some of them have been designed in, in things like COBOL, for instance. There aren't that many COBOL programmers still active in the workplace. And so it is, for me anyway, about really understanding better the way in which the systems that you are using as your foundation have been designed before you actually build on top of that some of these other large-scale projects. And for some people, that may not be possible. But then we need to be looking at some risk mitigation in that particular space. And so I don't expect any organization to suddenly hold back on some of these massive digital transformation programs. What I think that uh, there is a requirement for them to do, however, is to conduct some fairly stringent and in-depth risk assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are very many tools out there to do that. Of course, the ISF provides IRM2, which enables people to do that kind of thing. But so that you've got a, at least an eyes open chance of really understanding what you're getting into. But, you know, we shouldn't underestimate the pressure that organizations are under particularly with the, um, the desire to not just provide very large-scale systems, but also have the ability to be able to access them from mobile devices that themselves were never designed to be hugely secure mm -hmm. across a variety of different architectures that exist within very large-scale organizations. The problem, of course, would go away if we were all able to start our businesses with a blank sheet of paper. Nobody's in that position. And so I think we need to take some action that really allows us to take into account the fact that we have significant legacy systems that are out there that we have to make use of. And for me, this is really the role of the risk specialist. Right. Let's shift the conversation a bit. While there is more and more concern about the dominance of the tech field by a few big players, do you think, Steve, that their extensive, expensive, well-maintained infrastructure actually provides security and protection for us versus increased risk? 
I think the challenge for all businesses with this consolidation that we've seen in the tech field with the very large players. I'm thinking of people like Alphabet, for instance, Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, is that the consolidation that has taken place has certainly provided benefit. But there is increasing concern that they dominate the market. Mm -hmm. And that concern is being discussed quite openly now across Europe. It's being discussed quite openly in the United States. The FTC is certainly looking into some of these areas. So I think that one of the things that we talk about in Threat Horizon 2021 is this anticipation that at some point within the next couple of years, at least one of the big tech giants will be broken up. That will significantly disrupt, we believe, the availability of some of the products and services that they provide to dependent organisations. Mm. You know, the one-stop shop is very, very attractive, particularly when you've got a large provider like that. Life becomes very much easier for the buyer. But the impact of that is going to be disruptive. And in the worst case, we will see, I think, some malicious actors starting to prey upon vulnerable organisations. So the challenge in this uh, in this area really is for every business to understand better its exposure to the services that they're potentially buying from big tech giants and to think about some of those alternative arrangements that they might want to put in place in the event of a breakup and to plan for that because, as you've rightly pointed out, you don't want to lose the security and the protection mm-hmm. that they can currently provide. And so as we look forward, we do anticipate at least one of them breaking up. That means that some organisations will have to look for uh, other providers. And the time to be preparing for that, I think, is now. I think it's incumbent upon organisations to really be identifying this in a risk register and to be really looking at how they can plan for the day when uh, when something like this does happen. Hmm. There have been recent instances of organizations exposing the vulnerabilities of their competitors. How serious of a threat will this be to organizations in the future? And what do you think CISOs can do to guard against it? Yeah, this sort of exposure of vulnerabilities, again, nothing new. I think one of the things that uh, we are starting to see, however, which is slightly different, is the amount of time that's being provided to put in place a patch to rectify a vulnerability before there is public disclosure. Mm. Now, for a high-impact vulnerability, it roughly takes 34, 35 days to be able to patch that. We're starting to see timelines being issued of, you know, 30 days. Unless you patch this, we're going to publicly disclose. We've seen spats between people like Microsoft and Google, Google and Microsoft, you know, each having a go at each other in this area. And that's, uh, I guess, the way that things have been. But the real challenge in here is we do anticipate what we term digital vigilantes beginning to weaponize this vulnerability disclosure. So Mm. attackers taking advantage of the fact that there is a finite time that's required to put right a vulnerability. And so using that as a means of undercutting organizations, potentially destroying corporate reputations or even manipulating stock prices. You know, we saw some examples with AMD, for instance, just last year, where there was spurious information being spread about some of their chips, which then had an impact on stock price and so on. So this kind of thing we're starting to, uh, I think, anticipate as being a much bigger threat than it has been in the past. So what can CISOs do to guard against it? Well, I think it is about, you know, reviewing and improving perhaps some of the processes that they have in place across their businesses anyway for managing technical vulnerabilities so that when a vulnerability is really called out, they know how to respond to it. And that will include things like vulnerability scanning because you need to understand Mm -hmm. when these things are happening. It will necessarily include some form of remediation. You need to know what you're going to do about it and how you're going to do it. And again, you know, one of the security old chestnuts, patch management, Mm -hmm. just making sure that you have got your systems as up to date as possible. So again, it's back to that basic cyber hygiene, I think, in this particular space. And certainly for me anyway, that would be one of the key messages to CISOs as to how they can really deal with some of these vulnerabilities we've just been touching on. So really CISOs must be ever more proactive rather than responsive, sounds like. Yeah, I think so. I think that's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, a number of them are certainly doing that. I think 
One of the challenges for many is that they have been coming off the back of a period of underinvestment, and so they are still playing catch up. And so it is a question of how do I prioritize? How do I determine where I'm going to spend my dollars, euros, pounds, whatever the currency happens to be? And for me, again, that really points to the need for a much more detailed, grown up conversation with the business. Because risk appetite in an organization is not something that the CISO sets. Risk appetite is determined in the boardroom. And so CISOs have to be, I think, much better at engaging with the business, but articulating some of the challenges that we've been talking about in Threat Horizon and really helping business leaders, board members to assess those and the likelihood of and the impact of them as they apply specifically to their business situation and specifically to the risk appetite that the organization has got. If they can do that effectively, then resources will be made available. But as I say, you know, the challenge is that for a large number, they're still coming off the back of a period of underinvestment. And so it is about having to make hard choices. My advice to CISOs is that that is not a choice that they should be making on their own. Mm -hmm. That They do need to be engaging with the business in having those conversations. So being proactive and doing due diligence will be key to competing successfully in an increasingly turbulent digital marketplace. Basic security controls, such as regular patching, will play a role, as will more proactive approaches through threat intelligence, study of the regulatory environment, and engaging in strategic initiatives. The demands on the information security function will continue to be significant, and the response must be agile. In order to guard against threats, companies must tap into all available resources, such as the ISF threat radar and risk assessment tools. Steve, thank you for walking us through the in-depth conversations about Threat Horizon 2021. And for our listeners, for more information about the tools and resources available at the ISF, please visit securityforum.org.